Good morning. Uh, before we start, uh, Dr. Slick wants to have a word with you. He is our DIO. Does anybody know what a DIO is? It's an ACGME word, designated institutional official. So he's, he's the head man for us. I uh, just wanted to mention on uh, Friday, last Friday, the uh, Institutional Review Committee of um, ACGME uh, met to uh, review uh, the sponsor application for OSU CHS and also review the uh, sponsor application uh, for the uh, OMICO uh, Teaching Health Center uh, programs. And uh, both uh, sponsors uh, were uh, granted initial accreditation. So we now have received initial accreditation and uh, the programs, uh, all the programs now will be submitting uh, their uh, applications uh, for program accreditation. Uh, internal medicine uh, has received now officially initial accreditation as uh, a result of the sponsor uh, being uh, accredited. Um, just to let you know, if you have any questions, the ACGME uh, administration offices uh, have moved over to the professional office building, so we're now in uh, suite uh, 500 if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm on the ACGME Review Committee for Radiology. What I'm telling you is document everything, okay? So new innovations, put in all your stuff, and that, that's how we're evaluated. And if they don't see the numbers, we're going to do crummy. Well, I walked in this morning, and Dr. Ritz was back there, and he says, George, you're going to give the same talk you've given for 10 years? And he said, it's the osteopathic talk, and open artery works better. The rule of the artery is supreme, all right? So I said, yeah, I did change this, though, a little bit, right? Because there's been some changes in the last few years. So. Well, when I got called to, uh, is everybody hearing me okay? Everybody here all right? Nobody said no. Okay. Um, I was happy to be able to do that because there's been a lot of changes that kind of happened over the last six, eight, ten years that I think are really important. Can we turn off those can lights right there? All right. So we're going to jump into this. What hasn't changed is how we evaluate. We're part of a team. That's the team downstairs. But remember, the rest of the team is the team upstairs. You know, it's vascular surgery, it's cardiology, it's nephrology, it's internal medicine, okay? It's all the things that are super important, which we're going to talk about on the next uh, slide. I give this to every single patient that shows up with a wound, okay? You're not going to heal unless you do these things, okay? And so many people get sent to us, fix the artery, and I think the wound's going to heal. Well, guess what? If they're smoking up a storm, they're diabetes, they got a hemoglobin A1C at 13, and, you know, they're on 40 of prednisone a day for their Crohn's disease or asthma or whatever the heck it is, okay, you're going to lose. It's just not going to work. So that's why team approach is so important, okay, and medical management is so important. And I get all these people, fix my artery, you're going to be better. No, okay. And trying to get this into people's brains is really challenging, okay. I get calls from Indian healthcare centers and, you know, nurse practitioners and, they sent the person in for the 15th time and their you know, sugars are still 600 and they wonder how come they got a foot wound that isn't healing. Guess what? I don't care what you do to the water or the artery. It ain't going to work, okay? So we really go over these things. When I was in family practice, we used to do betadine whirlpools. We used to do peroxide. Guess what? We know those now are toxic, okay? You know, soap and water, uh, estrogen deficiency, poor social support. We got plenty of that in, in the United States. And I just heard a vascular surgeon give a talk about smoking. And, you know, the bad prognostic factors, we'll talk about that. They said if they tell you they smoke half a pack a day, that's really a pack. And if they tell you a pack, it's two packs. It's just kind of like alcohol, okay? So venous disease. Remember, we always got to think about venous disease. Probably 80% of all wounds have a venous component, and we tend not to think about that a little bit, all right? So uh, that's kind of the evaluation. Uh, for 100 years, uh, the baseline treatment for... Uh, Venous disease has been compression. There's other things we can do, but compression, compression, compression. There's a lot of ways to do compression besides just garments. There's 
wraps, coband one, coband two, all kinds of things, right? Sequential compression devices. What is peripheral arterial disease? It's really the same thing coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease is. There isn't enough blood flow to the end organ, okay? And that happens to be the foot or whatever it is, the limb and, and the extremities. I'm not gonna talk about intermittent claudication for as far as I'm concerned. Most of the time, that's medical management, walking, stuff like that, those risk factors, all right? And most of those people will probably not need anything. The focus of this talk is this, rest pain, non-healing, ulcers, gangrene, call it tissue loss, okay? Because these people got troubles, all right? Intermittent claudication, it's common. Um, four and a half percent of the patients greater than 60 years of age, male greater than female. Diabetes increases the risk five times, increases amputation rate to 21%. The trifecta is smoking, diabetes, and stage renal disease. You, that, that, that's, that's the perfect negative trifecta, okay? Cigarette smoking, uh, claudications worsens in 31% who continue, 8% who stop, amps required in 11%, and that's really what we're trying to prevent, who continue in 0% and those who stop. If you look at the diabetic population with um, an ulceration, they wind up with an amp, 50% are dead in five years. You add smoking to that, higher percent dead. Add stage, end stage renal disease, higher number are dead, okay? Five-year mortality in those who continue to smoke is up to 90%, and what usually gets them, sudden cardiac death, okay? Risk of sudden death is eight times higher. This is total body disease. Looks a lot like Framingham risk factors, because that's what it is, okay? And you know, in Oklahoma, we smoke really good, and we do obesity really good, okay? What's the fate of claudicators? Just what I said, okay? The majority of them, especially in, I think, in the world of statins, statins are really changing the medical management. There's uh, trials going on, look at, you know, high-dose statins, antiplatelet agents for cerebrovascular disease, vascular disease in other beds, and they really look pretty good. So, you know, one of your big weapons is moderate to high-dose statins, all right? Keep that in your brain. Peripheral arterial disease occurs late, 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 in the natural history of atherosclerosis, it's a marker for those other beds, cerebrovascular bed, coronary bed. 60% have coronary disease, 30% need something like a stent or a bypass or whatever. Um, 20 to 25% uh, have cerebrovascular disease. Look at that mortality, it's really nasty. So when you see a person with a toe wound, hey, listen to their carotids. You know, ask them about chest pain with exertion. Think about these other things because it's highly likely they're gonna have it and it's gonna impact what we do. This is super important, okay, because the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and just this July, uh, SIR, they say the exact same thing, okay? And, and sometimes we don't do such a good job of this, okay? So when we evaluate these folks, history and physical, it's an osteopathic thing, okay? I see these in, you know, indication for exam, leg wound. Well, where was it, okay? Their little toe, their big toe, their tibial area, their knee, that's not an indication for exam. And in fact, in the, uh, J in the JVIR article, it says you cannot interpret ABIs, TBIs, and all these non-invasive things unless you know the clinical milieu. And I see that all the time. People get these things dictated and, you know, it's like, what the hell does this mean, okay, relative to the patient, okay? And what are those basic things? ABIs, toe brachial index, with pulse volume recordings. I went to an intervascular ultrasound course taught by a bunch of vascular surgeons and they said, we don't want primary care people doing ABIs because if they see a 0.9 or a 0.8, they figure they don't have disease. We like PVRs because if the PVR is flat, something's wrong. So for those of us that look at these studies, you gotta look at the big picture, okay? And the big picture includes pulse volume recordings. Duplex ultrasound, as a standalone, all it does is confuse people. Unless you know the clinical milieu, okay, you're just confusing them. And you gotta put all this stuff together. But the only things that are validated for helping us understand and what we're really looking for is a marker of tissue perfusion are these things. It's the only ones that are validated. It's the only ones we have numbers for. And when we're trying to decide whether a wound's gonna heal or not, these are the tools we have that are validated, okay? Because I see all these other kind of things out here. How about speed? Is there validation for that? No, but is it helpful? Yeah, it can be. When you do an angiogram and you see a blush in the wound, is that helpful? Yeah, it is. If you do an angiogram and you get good straight line flow, is that helpful? Yeah, it is. But it's not validated and it doesn't have the same values that this does. So one of the reasons I was happy to get to talk is I get called, well, grandma has a wound on her foot. Do I need a CT angiogram? Absolutely not. 
what you need is a history and physical and non-invasive evaluation, okay? And we'll talk about where this fits in the algorithm, but this slide is the single most important one. One of the things that's getting ready to happen in medicine, it's already happened, Dr. Ritz can tell you about this, is we're not gonna get paid for volume. We're gonna get paid for value. And I can tell you these cost a hell of a lot more money, don't give you as much information as these, okay? And the most cost-effective thing you do is your history and physical. So if I don't say anything else, that's, that's where we're at. Where did this come from? Did I make it up? No, okay? ACC, AHA, put this document out. I think it was revised, uh, anyhow, 2013, somewhere in there. So this is super important because that's what these guys say. And who makes up the AHA? Zillions of specialties, vascular surgery, cardiology, interventional radiology, nephrology, all the ologies are in there, okay? So go through this, diagnosis and treatment of critical limb ischemia. What is the first thing we do? We do a history and physical. You document lower extremity pulses. If you palpate good pulses in the foot, you're probably not dealing with big vessel disease. Could you be embolizing? Yeah, you sure could. Remember about 20% of the people with purple toes and fingers and strokes and all that junk likely have a cardiac source. So we need really good echoes, okay? And that can be a really hard problem, you know, when you got a barrel chest and all the other vicissitudes with getting decent echoes, okay? But that, that's, that's the tool we use to look in the heart. Assess factors that contribute to risk, those risk factors. What's next? Those non-invasive things we just talked about. Now, can you diagnose PAD from an ABI? No, you can't, okay? You diagnose PAD from a history and physical, and then if the ABI, TBI agrees with that, it's okay, but you can't do it, and that's what we're doing all the time in our reports, okay? So what are the signs of that? ABI less than 0 0.4, flat PVRs, absent pedal flow. You know, you got the wound, you got the clinical exam, you're gonna go do something and start them on systemic antibiotics if there's skin uh, ulceration and limb infection is present. And in fact, the VA about 15 years ago did a study and they didn't do this stuff. All they did is they saw this poor VA guy come in, he's got what looked like a diabetic foot wound. They put him on six weeks antibiotics and many of them healed. Now I'm not recommending you do that because a chunk of those will wind up with AMPs. And what we're trying to do is if you look at the globality of the people that get AMPs, only 30% get an angiogram and get a try at fixing before they cut them off. That's tragedy, okay? Because if you amputate somebody, you're putting them in the grave, okay? Um, anyhow, so once you get to all that stuff, then you can get down to vascular specialist evaluation and you know, let them do what they wanna do, okay? So, uh, and TASC, which is the equivalent of our AHA, agrees, okay? That's the European version. Did I skip a slide? Yeah. History, claudications, usually caused by focal stenoses. We're not really worried about that too much. But there was a guy here I got to be involved with had been having claudication in his left leg for about three months. All of a sudden came in with a white foot, okay? Why was that? He had high-grade stenosis. He embolized on top of it, and that was his issue, okay? Exertional cramping. Now, the key to arterial, arterial claudication is reproducibility. Every time I walk 100 feet, every time I walk two minutes, every, 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 every time. Think about that. Now, here's a little trick. For those people that say, Doc, when I go to Wally World, and I lean over the cart and I can walk farther, that's probably not arterial disease, that's probably a central canal stenosis, okay? And remember, venous disease, arterial disease, spine disease, lots of things can mimic uh, claudication, okay? Claudication comes from the Latin word claudico, which means to come up lame. So as your job as a DO physician is to try to dive into that and ask those really specific questions, really important, very helpful, okay? History. Rest pain, usually secondary to multi-level occlusions. Keep that in your brain because I'm gonna show you a bunch of trials for all kinds of things, stents and balloons and all this junk. In the FDA world, most of those are 10 centimeter segments. In the, most of the people with chronic limb ischemia, it's 20, 30, lots of disease segments, all right? So we have to be a little careful when we start interpreting those studies into what that really mean, okay? Um, and Ischemic neuritis, I always tell people, you go to church, cross your leg too long, you stand up and you feel all those, you know, tinglings, you know, all that stuff at your leg, that's ischemic neuritis, but these people have it in spades. So when you go to the uh, ICU afterwards and somebody's giving you 0 0.5 milligrams of Dilaudid every 12 hours, that ain't gonna cut it, okay? You gotta give them big doses, okay, because they hurt like hell. Non-healing ulcers, remember tissue loss, worsened by elevation, relieved by dependency inspection, this is all part of stuff we're supposed to do. And document this. Medical photography is really important. When I read an H&P, I want to see 
2.3 centimeter wound, Wagner 2, da 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 da, what's it look like? A good description. Too many of these people, I get the consult, and it's like they didn't even talk about what the problem was in the physical exam. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, something. Physical exam, what's important? Decreased pulses, cool leg, you know, warm, 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 cold, cold, cold. Documentation. Um, decreased uh, sensation, decreased motor. Once you get something that looks cadaveric, it's lost sense, it's lost motor, it's time to call Larry Dooley or somebody else, okay? Uh, we have to be really careful about that. Now, in the people that have chronic PAD, a lot of them can have some collaterals, and they may or may not come back. And there's been several times where I called Larry down, and he'd say, go ahead and see what you can do. And I've been amazed that they come back, all right? But ha have, have your buddies on board with you. ABI, super, super important. It's the base thing that we do. It's taken after the patient's been at rest, quiet and supine. Did we do it this way? Inflate the cuff at least 20 millimeters above, slow cuff the patient. And just like blood pressures, it can vary 10, 15%. So several of them are important. It gets us in the ballpark, okay? That's super important. Now, are we diagnosing uh, PAD with these? No, we do a clinical exam, and if this fits, yes, then we can say it. But we can't say it without knowing this clinical information. So, and can you have a purple toe with an ABI of one? Yeah, you sure can. What if you embolized? Okay, important, all right? And that's validated, all right? This is validated too, okay? Toe, systolic pressure greater than 30, 92% heal, okay? That's a goal. Toe systolic pressure index, less than 0 0.6, unlikely to heal. Transcutaneous O2s, less than 20, unlikely to heal. Those are useful, useful, validated things, okay? I like to keep copies of that hanging around. Critical factors of imaging, complete evaluation of the vasculature from the aorta to wherever it is, okay? Um, Got to see bony landmarks. Remember, vascular surgeons are our friends, and we're always asking the question, what's going to be best here? Okay. Is this a good FEMPOP candidate? Okay, you got to ask those questions. Surgeons need good above and good below. They need a place to hook in above and a place to hook in below, and just like us, they are most concerned about inflow and outflow. Doing a connection to something without any outflow isn't going to work, okay, and that becomes really important. Continuity of tibial vessels into the pedal arch, okay, things we talked about. You can't look at a picture and decide what's going on, okay. You have to push a guide wire against it. You have to put a CTO crossing device against it. You have to try. You never know whether you can get through it or not unless you try, and that's super important. And we're getting better and better tools to help us get across, and I'll talk briefly about that. There's lots of ways to look in there. I don't worry about renal function uh, because we have CO2. We've got lots of ways to do that and lots of ways to guide things, okay? Um, I went to, I've been to a bunch of limb salvage courses. Most of them are run by vascular surgeons or cardiologists, and I went down to Dallas, and the cardiologist showed me this person had a CTA, and they whacked off their right leg, and they didn't see anything in the left leg, but they came to him, and he was able to revascularize their left leg. So I was the only interventional radiologist in the group, and they said, hey, how come the CTA didn't show anything? I said, because it's not a real angiogram. Remember when you do a CTA or an MRA, it's a snapshot in time. When they turn on the scanner, what phase of contrast are you in? Normal people, 20 to 30 seconds were in the arterial phase, but if you've got severe PAD, that could be 40 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds, you don't know. That's the advantage of Doppler ultrasound, that's the advantage of a real angiogram, is you can just image over that territory until you can see collaterals coming in. So a CTAs and MRAs are not real angiograms, so remember that, okay? What's the role of MRA? Bottom line, MRI can show you arteries, and it's the best tool for infection, osteomyelitis, stuff like that, okay? That's basically what that says. And it can Doppler ultrasound and MRA can see tiny vessels that can change how we manage better than contrast angiography, okay? So if we're trying to decide Larry Dooley needs to do an anterior tibial bypass, maybe we shouldn't give up unless we do a Doppler ultrasound or MR and see if he has a target. So IR are people that you know, poke holes in people and try to fix things with imaging guidance. Now we're going to move. What I just talked about, I think, is by far and away 90% of what you need to take home from this talk, okay? The rest of it is, hey, where are we going, okay? Conventional treatment, lifestyle changes, medications, we talked about that. PTA and stent, and I'm going to tell you why I hate stents, and we'll talk about that in a minute, except for one stent. Um, bypass, we had a lady that was an uh, IR tech with us, and she'd worked at Mercy in Oklahoma City, and uh, she, it was a vascular surgeon that did endovascular stuff, and she was always saying to me, Fempop, 
fem pop, fem pop. And so that's really important, okay? Keep that in your brain, okay? Really important, that's part of the team approach. We're trying really hard to avoid that. Some people aren't gonna be able to avoid it, but we're trying to avoid it, okay? So, and m most of the folks we're gonna be dealing with are these folks, I'm gonna pound through this pretty quick, but it's important in terms of how we treat them. Diabetics, high risk, okay? Uh, risk of lower limb critical ischemia is five times greater than the normal population. Some people think by 2030, 30% of our population is gonna be diabetics, really important. Let's go back to this one. This is important, what happens? Increased amount of connective tissue in the art, in their artery wall, increased amounts of calcium. These changes lead to a loss of elasticity. So if you're trying to give them a vasodilator, what's that doing? Nothing, okay, because that thing's a rock, okay? Vasodilators may work on the capillary bed. And when I trained um, initially, we were taught never touch a tibial perineal vessel because you cause an amp. Well, guess what? These people are gonna get an amp if you don't fix them. So your goal is open up everything you can see, okay? That's the goal. So what are the indications for revascularization, risk of amputation, critical limb ischemia, ulcers, all that kind of stuff, all right? Those are the indications. And how do we do this? Well, this is straight out of the cardiologist textbook, okay? Because that's the way they do things in the heart. Except we do prolonged inflations, especially in the tibial uh, vessels. Every vascular territory is different. Aorta is different than iliacs. SFA pop, different than below the knee. So you'll see us talk about that differently because what you do in each vascular bed is different, okay? But the bottom line is whatever you have to do, get them open. And this actually came from an Italian place and he leaves his balloons up for about 10 minutes and his limb salvage rates are as high as anybody else reporting in the literature now. But he sizes them accurately, which is really important, okay? Because angiograms lie to you on sizes, IVUS doesn't. Maximize medical therapy to include maximum dose statins. We talked about that, clopidogrel. And this just goes shows bad tibial perineal vessels. You can get them open, and they've got decent inflow and decent outflow. They can heal. And what's that say there? Um, you want direct flow, all right? And one of the big things that's going on in our world is something called an angiosome, okay? What's that mean? It means the anterior tibial artery runs the forefoot. Posterior tibial artery runs uh, the bottom of the foot, okay, and the hind foot. You got a perineal that feeds into this. But guess what they're finding out? If you do perfusion, it doesn't always work. And if you've been diabetic for 25 or 30 years, you lose your plantar arch. It is still true, if you've got a four foot wound, work really hard to get that anterior tibial artery open. But basically in the setting of limb ischemia, in the setting of limb uh, tissue loss, open up as much as you can because you don't know what's going on. You're trying to increase total perfusion. Why do cardiologists do nuclear medicine stress tests? That's a perfusion study, okay? And in the heart, does the right coronary always feed everything it's supposed to? No, it doesn't, okay? How about in the brain? Does, you know, anterior cerebral artery always feed everything it's supposed to? No, it doesn't. What you were taught in medical school, at least in the brain, is only 20% correct because we're looking at collateral flow. It's perfusion that counts. And I'll go through this pretty quick because uh, I want to get to this. Recanalize as many arteries as possible, okay? It's those bullet points we want to try to get to. In some cases, stenotic collaterals from perineal to pedal and plantar can be successfully dilated. We didn't used to be able to do this. And it used to be if you put a balloon in there, you'd break it, but now you can get something going. Uh, remember I said you can't fix anything unless you can get across it. And we have lots and lots of occlusions and they've been difficult for us for a long time. So these are just some of the tools that are out there. This is a little grinder, a little 018 grinder on the end of a wire. Um, this is a little auger, okay, and, and we've got this thing downstairs. I'll talk about that. You can use lasers. These are called reentry devices where you go subintimal and try to get back in the vessel. Um, this is a Pioneer. It's a reentry device. It has an ultrasound probe on the end. So when you turn it, you know where to poke out the needle if you actually end up in the lumen. Once you can get a wire across an occlusion, you can fix it, okay? And that shows us laser, which we don't have because the box cost $80,000. You'd like to be intraluminal. This is the way we've done it in the past. Buckle a guide wire and hope it stays in there someplace. Okay, comes out. This thing is like a little baby jackhammer, kinda, okay, jackhammer. It's really not a jackhammer. Uh, what it does, it oscillates at 20,000 hertz while there's sterile saline going in there. Just like the water coming out of your faucet in the, in the, in the kitchen, you know, has all those bubbles in it. That's a, in a way oscillation. It helps clean off your plates, does the same thing. So if you put this on soft tissue and turn it on, it doesn't do anything. If you put it on hard calcification or up against a sheetrock, it'll bore right through it, okay? So that's it. But part of the problem with all these is they're dumb, okay? 
what does that mean? They don't know where the true lumen is, okay? And that's the holy grail, is how do you get in the true lumen? And that, that's a really big problem, okay? So once you get across something, you can fix it, and that's the important parts there. And we'll talk about fixing here in a minute. This is an important part of how do I get across, okay? Now, nobody had thought about this 20 years ago when I started doing this, but if you, if you can't get across from up above, can you get across from below, all right? And this kind of started out as accessing posterior tibial and anterior tibial down around the ankle, passing wires up from below. They said it improved your ability to cross about 80%. Uh, it's now whatever you can stick below, whether that's popliteal, SFA, whatever, it doesn't matter. Stick what you can. People are, are, are sticking metatarsal arteries and coming from below. But the technique is the same. Use ultrasound, fluoro, whatever it takes. Try to get a baby needle in, and this is not hard, okay? I've spent hours trying to get into some of these things. But if you can get in them, it improves your ability to get across, and if you can get across, you can fix. And now companies are making things that you can fix, especially tibial perineal arteries and some of the others, right through a little four-print sheath and an anterior tib or a posterior tib. Think about what cardiology does via the radial approach. Okay, that's kind of the analogy, okay? And I'll skip that. But you've got to be willing to be aggressive in accessing below the lesion. All right, and that's really the key. If you can get across, you can fix. Now we're going to talk a little bit about fixing. Lots of ways to do that. In the old days, we did angioplasty, okay, and then came stents, covered and uncovered, atherectomies, which is take some of the stuff out, drug elution, and this is a big deal. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about stents and why I hate stents, okay? So if you take out my SFA and you held it up in the middle, it's going to be like a limp piece of spaghetti, okay? It's just going to kind of droop. What if you put a stent up there? It's going to stretch out like that, okay? The SFA, and we're going to show you a picture of that, and all arteries for that matter, they move, okay? And everything around them moves. So the motion that used to be in the segment that got stented, where does that get transferred to the ends of the stents? Cardiologists talk about candy wrapper stenosis. What does that mean? <laughs> it's just like wherever there's bending and that force gets transferred to the end of the stent and it digs in, digs in, digs in forever, 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 you get into more hyperplasia. So that's one reason I don't like them. And we're going to see some data on that in a minute. And I'm talking about bare metal stents now. The other is, what's a stent? It's 90% nothing, okay? They take a piece of nitinol or something, and some of them are woven. But a stent is 80% nothing. It's got open cells. It's, it's open like that. What's to keep atherosclerosis from growing through the wall of the stent? Nothing, okay? So, and when we start looking at some numbers here in a little bit, think a little bit about that. Now, the Japanese and some of the holy grail that's getting ready to happen are, think about Vicryl, Dexon, stuff like that, absorbable suture. They're making those into stents that are going to absorb in about six months. And what if we put some kind of chemical on it that's anti restenotic Okay, that's kind of a holy grail, stuff that's maybe coming. Japan has it already. This is, this is the problem artery, probably the most single difficult artery to treat in the whole cotton-picking body, which is why fempops are still pretty important, okay? But it shows all the, think about what happens when you move your thigh. What happens to that SFA, okay? Lots and lots of forces, okay? So... Compression forces, torsional forces, extrinsic, twisting, all kinds of stuff, nasty. Now you know why it doesn't do good. Lots of different kinds of stents, we'll talk about them. Um, we'll talk about two, un two kinds of unique stents in a minute. One is uh, a Viabon, which has Gore-Tex over. Think about when the vascular surgeon doesn't have vein, he uses a piece of Gore-Tex, that's basically what this is, is an endovascular Gore-Tex graft, okay. Uh, life stents, okay, bare metal stent. This is the Viabon, it's covered. The inside is uh, Gore-Tex, and they bond it with uh, heparin. One of the problems with all stents, remember, is that edge stenosis, these guys had a lot of problems with it. Um, second version, they changed the way they built this. They say there's less problems, and it comes in lots of different lengths. And this 25 centimeter one is like $4,000. It's not cheap, okay, but cheaper than a fempop. Atherectomy. Now, atherectomy, in my mind, ought to be an Andrew Taylor still thing, okay? Remember, he said the open artery works better than the closed artery, and the thinking is, if something's plugged up, why don't you try to take some of the stuff out? There's lots of ways to do that. We looked at the laser, okay? We don't have one of those because we don't have an $8,000 box. Jetstream Navitus is this thing spins and it does suction and it kind of cleans things out. And I think the people at St. Francis use this, okay? Plaque excision in the lower extremities, which we've done a ton of here. Uh, the latest version of this is called TurboHawk because it's a lot better calcium cutter than the original. 
but the bottom line is it's a little cutter wheel. You activate this in the artery, push it forward, and it shaves off the plaque. Think about planing a door. Just takes a little bit of time, and you actually open up the, the vessel, D, uh, which is important. And really important here in a little bit is when we talk about calcium, because if you've got a heavily calcified artery, we're going to talk all about paclitaxel. Paclitaxel can't work if you've got thick calcium. This thing helps get rid of calcium and plaque and make paclitaxel work better. We're going to talk about that. Really, really important. It's changing things. But that's how that works. Basically, you scrape out the end stuff, okay? Now, one of the things I always tell patients when I'm getting ready to give them statistics, and you know, you and I are full of statistics, I always tell them there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, and I'm fixing to give you some, all right? And you're going to see some here in a minute. So when we look at sub suboptimal patency rate, this says PTA 61%. This is really pretty old data, TAT uh, 2000. Stents, 67%. This is one year. Keep that in your brain, too, okay? So again, this is the osteopathic thing, okay? If you just balloon it, you just stretch the thing out. If you stent it, the stent holds it stretched out. Why not clean it out a little bit, okay? Um, this shows intervascular ultrasound, which is the most useful tool we have to know what the size of the artery is, what's inside the artery, and the rest of the things we use are pretty terrible. But this is pre- and post-atherectomy. You can see there's a bigger lumen. And, you know, bad disease, open something up, get it some more blood flow, and, uh, you know, you can heal. This is another atherectomy device, okay? It's a diamondback, okay? Think of a piece of sandpaper on an eccentric uh, fishing weight that you spin inside the artery, and you basically sand it. This is a carbon fiber block. The faster you spin it, the bigger the orbit. The bigger the orbit, uh, the more it grinds it down. Now, the neat thing about this is it works on calcium, but it doesn't work on a normal artery, okay? So it, it, it only works where there's calcification, really important, okay? Now, the people that make this thing say that the particulate stuff that goes downstream is less than the size of a white blood cell, okay, or a red blood cell, right? And this is showing particulate distribution. Uh, we actually, I, I did a ton of these, but I got a guy that had been a diabetic for 30 years, well-controlled IDDM, and I did one of these in his tibial perineal artery, and we embolized his foot. And I started thinking about that. Uh, what's the capillary bed look like in a person that's been diabetic for 30 years, okay? And that's, that's something we haven't really thought about. So I have not used this as much since then, all right? It's still, I think, a useful tool for tibial perineal arteries. All right, and that's it, okay. So uh, non-operative alternatives and adjuncts. In, in my prior life, when I gave this talk, I talked about all those things we just talked about. But this is what's evolved, and I'm going to spend a little time. In the past, I would say at the end of my talk, at this time, these devices play a role in treating lesions not well treated with angioplasty. But that's not true today, OK? What's changed? Drug elution, all right? Now, that's got a trade name on it, but it's the only drug eluting stent for in the periphery right now, OK? Remember what I said about lies, damn lies, and statistics? Here we go, OK? But this is, this is real world data, OK? And we're going to talk a little bit about how trials are formed. But remember, we looked at what was that PTA, you know, one-year patency rate before. It was up around 50 60 percent. This is a more recent trial. It says 33 percent, okay? And you always got to ask, who are the people in this trial? And then this goes through standard bare metal stent. This is the Viabond. This is the Zilver, okay? It's the only drug eluting stent that's out there. This is Supera, which showed up downstairs. This is a woven nitinol stent. And this is atherectomy, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about it. These are all the trials. This is going to become really important down here, okay? So for those of us that look at carotid ultrasounds, we look at something called the ICA-CCA ratio, big fancy name. But if you take a garden hose and the water's going through it, and it's hot in the summer, and you kink it, you can start feeling some gurgling there, okay? Once you get up around 50% stenosis, with ultrasound, what we're looking at is the velocity through that area of kink. And if you've got what we call an ICA-CCA ratio, in other words, peak systolic velocity below, peak systolic velocity above 100 up here, 200 back here, you're at a, 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 a ratio of 2, okay? Once you go above 2, you're in the 50 to 69% stenosis range. 2 and below, no significant stenosis. Going to be really important here because guess what? In these trials, that's how they look for recurrent stenoses. And when you start seeing 2.4s, 2.5s, 2. whatever, those people are having significant stenoses, and they're counting them as normal. 
see some problems there, okay? So these people in their drug eluting stent use two. In the early part of the Supera, in 264 patients, they use two. But in their latter study, uh, in 495, they use 2.4. That becomes important. And basically what it says is you can't compare data, okay? How about that, okay? Um, so this is actually looking at that woven stent, all right? And if you look at the numbers, you know, 787, 264, um, you look at how sick they were. That's called the Rutherford classification. The people in the Zilver PTX were much sicker, had lots more problems, and they used a lower peak systolic velocity ratio, okay, than the other folks. And there was actually a, the, the uh, Zilver PTX was a randomized control, and they took them and they went straight to Zilver PTX, or they predilated. How did it look? Okay, and if it looked crummy, you got a Zilver PTX. If you had an optimal PTA, um, you know, they stopped. Now, what's really the problem? What did they do? They used an angiogram to decide what side to balloon. That's a real problem, okay? Because angiograms don't tell you the right answer, okay? Unless you're doing IBIS, it's really hard to size. Now, if we look and we look on that arm of that study where they pre-dilated and then put in the Zilver stent, this is at one year, okay, 91%, okay? So that makes that guy jump up there. Why is this? Anytime you do something inside of the artery and expose the media, you get atherosclerosis with a vengeance, which is why if you oversize stents, if you oversize balloons, you get atherosclerosis with a vengeance. So what's happened? They coat these things with a drug, whether that's paclitaxel or whatever. It's an anti restenotic agent. And, you know, we know in the heart it works. This is in the body. We're looking at that, okay? So, again, the numbers start to change, all right? So you can't compare, this is part of what I talked to you about, that peak systolic velocity ratio to 2.4. Um, greater than 2, less than 40%, you know, 2.5, you're really getting into significant stenosis. Whoops, let's go back to that one. This is a drug-eluting balloon. This is a drug-eluting balloon. So you can put paclitaxel on balloons. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, when they looked at the balloons, and this is plus or minus, patency ending point, uh, da 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 not significant at PSR, which means it was no better than regular angioplasty uh, if you did a peak systolic velocity ratio 2.0. Remember what I said about calcium. That's going to become really, 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 really important because drug can't work unless it gets through the calcium, all right? No difference between plano balloons and drug coating balloons in that trial. Two things really matter when considering device selection SFA, long-term performance in randomized controlled trials, level one data, consistent performance across multiple trials, and again, they're saying this, all right, but remember, we gotta talk about calcium. Only the, the drug eluting stent can lay claim to meeting both of these considerations because they spent a lot of money, did a lot of people, and they got really good data, okay? Proven durability of results, this upper line out to five years, and you notice, most people stop at a year, okay? But 72.4% with provisional uh, uh, um, placement of the Zilver stent. So they got a dilatation. They put the thing in. And somehow, and how they put the chemical in the, in, on the balloon or in the stent, that's incredibly proprietary. Okay, I've been a consultant at Covidian. They're trying to do a, pol a polymer uh, a deposition. Um, these guys here, this is a salt, okay, that has uh, uh, paclitaxel in it. And how the biochemistry works, how it gets in the vessel is just unbelievable. I mean, you got all these PhD biochemists trying to figure this out. And, you know, part of the problem is we are so diverse in our pathology, it's difficult to figure out. But anyhow, bottom line, it works good, okay? And they got good data, the best data that's out there, okay? Final thoughts, based on long-term and real-world data, Zilver PTX is standard for SFA. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Remember what I said about lies of analyzing statistics? Predilatation matters. Failed angioplasty due to calcium, 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 calcium. This section or recoil, use a drug eluting stent, Zilver PTX, this guy right there. You need a drug, super important. You need a drug to fight intimal hyperplasia. That's what's changed, okay? No matter the design, okay, bare metal stents, um, you, you've got, don't have an anti restenotic agent, okay? And it talks about these things, atherectomy when needed, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, okay? Key differences between and the drug coated balloon and the drug eluting stent trials, calcification. Remember, I talked about this, okay? The drug can't get in if it's heavily calcified. So the bottom line is do an atherectomy, get rid of the calcium, 
make it possible that if you follow with a drug eluting balloon, the chemical can get in. You've got to get the chemical into the wall of the vessel, and they didn't do any of that in any of these trials. So the drug eluting balloons are going to look crummy because they're trying to get chemical to go through big, dense calcium. It ain't going to work, okay? So uh, the guys from Zilver PTX have done 2,100 patients. They got multiple trials, and their data is awesome. It's you know, randomized controlled stuff, level one, and they have really good data out to five years. Most people go out to a year, all right? So, and, and that's chemical, okay? So keep chemical in your mind. We're going to come back to that in a minute, okay? So what do you do when nothing else works, all right? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about, pneumatic arterial compression. When you and I walk, okay, arteries are carrying the blood out. When we walk, the muscular activity in our legs squishes on the veins and gets the blood flowing back. And there's a gradient, say like if your arterial pressure is 120 and the venous pressure is 0 to 5, that gradient helps improve blood flow across the capillary bed. People with wounds, um, most people, in, at, especially towards the end of their life, have venous disease. Their venous pressures are higher, and therefore that gradient across the capillary bed is less. So the bottom line is squeeze it, okay? Do something to, get, to decrease that venous pressure so you increase the gradient across the capillary bed so you get a little more flow across that. Remember, we talked about perfusion early on, okay? So this was something that was once available, all right? It got taken off the market or you can't get it anymore. But Mayo's did all the stuff on it, all right? And actually, they showed huge, huge, huge differences, okay? People that had failed everything else, they were keeping about 60% of their limbs on. And whenever you see a slide like this about how something works, it really means we don't know. The bottom line is, does it help or does it not, okay? They were able to measure increased blood flow in the popliteal artery. So we'll talk about that in a minute. We're getting close to the end, okay? So what's the future of limb salvage? Better education of physicians and patients with peripheral arterial disease, better medical management, moderate to high dose statins, that's 60 to 80 milligrams Lipitor, 20 to 40 Crestor, big doses, okay? ACEs, ARBs, calcium channel antagonists, what are we talking about? Are we working on that calcified tibial perineal artery? No, we're working on the capillary bed. We're doing everything we can to improve perfusion, okay? And um, so that's really important. Antiplatelet agents, do they need hyperbarics? Think of the big picture, okay? Um, things that are making a big difference, crossing devices, retrograde access. Don't be bashful to stick downstream and come from below because it's going to 80% improve your ability to get across the occlusions. If you can't get across it, you can't fix it, okay? We talked about below the knee, uh, leaving that balloon inflated five to 10 minutes, and accurate sizing of the balloon. Another place I went, cardiologist, guy calls him a Mafusta, I can't say his name right, Wyoming, Michigan. He publishes a lot on um, uh, what I showed you, tibial perineal access. They say if it's at least not a three millimeter angioplasty in the tibial perineal arteries, you're not doing enough. Now, I think you need to put the IVUS down to know for sure, but I see a little people doing 1.5 millimeter angioplasty. You're not getting anywhere, okay? So you really need to know for sure, and you know, we, we oversize those balloons a little bit, all right? Um, but a normal tibial perineal artery is up around three millimeters, all right? Very important. For SFA disease, uh, you get some chemicals in there, really important, all right? So remember we talked about calcium. You know, do something to get that calcium out of the artery so that if you follow with a drug eluting balloon, the drug can get in there, really important. Now, these trials are way behind where the drug eluting stents are, but they're being done. And, and the COVIDian people have some trials where they got eight or 900 people on and they're following them, okay? So that, that is being done, all right? And here, what we did for a long time is atherectomy followed by plain balloon angioplasty. We're getting pretty cotton picking good results. Putting chemicals in there improves it, and Europe has data to show that, okay? So for those who uh, are doing crummy, uh, we talked about IPC, but then I put in mechanical compression devices for failures. What is a mechanical compression device that's available? It's an SCD, okay? So it's an SCD. So I always tell our people, if you don't know what the hell to do, make sure they're on maximum dose therapy and put an SCD. Have them pump their leg an hour twice a day. And it would be the same thing if you told them to walk 40 minutes a day, but these people can't, all right? And what are you doing? You're trying to increase that gradient from the artery to the vein. The, the whole name of the story is perfusion, okay? 
how do we perfuse better, okay? And, and that's ultimately the story. And then engage all your buddies, you know, call up everybody, you know, the people we talked about upstairs, what can we do to improve this, okay? And uh, the medical management is super important. Okay, summary, uh, limb salvage is possible in up to 80%. If you have a team approach, okay, if you're just fixing arteries and sending them back to podiatrists to the Indian healthcare system, you're going to lose, okay. Many endovascular techniques are available. It has to be customized for each patient. And remember, Sir Webb, ACC, AHA, um, TASC, which is the European versions. And if you read these documents, they mimic each other. So that's pretty reassuring. Where did all this come from, which we talked about? And like I said, it's been updated. All right, questions? Wow, this is a great turnout. It must be the early part of the year. I think if it was uh, May of next year, we may not have so many. But awesome. Thank you for coming, and if there's no question, we're finished.